So the next speaker is Christopher Preston from the University of Montana. Chris has spent, uh, an environmental philosopher, and has spent a lot of time working with European partners uh, on these issues. So Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, Brian. So as Brian said, I'm an environmental philosopher. I grew up in England, spent the first half of my life there. I now live in Montana. And when you do environmental philosophy, you investigate issues uh, such as wilderness, uh, naturalness, uh, animal rights, animal welfare. Um, and then we also have a, a sort of applied technology stream uh, of the ethics that we do. So that more recently, I've got involved in that. And um, I've done work in the ethics of nanotechnology and in the ethics of climate engineering. So I mentioned that because at the end of my presentation, I got a couple of remarks uh, about those technologies. Um, I'm co-author with Fern Wixon, who is sitting right there uh, from Genoc. And um, I, because we are equal co-authors, when the exceptionally hard ethical questions get directed my way, uh, I have a plan. Um, I haven't told Fern what my plan is yet, uh, but then there could be some redirection uh, of, uh, of the questions. So um, I wanted to sort of put on the table right at the beginning that we wouldn't be here unless there wasn't ethics at stake. Um, practically everything that has been said uh, so far today has been ethical in some respect. Um, something bad is going on in the world, whether that's a conservation issue, an agriculture issue, or a public health issue and there may be a technology that can address that concern, so something good could happen. So, you know, the, the conversation begins uh, in ethics. Um, I had a suggestion for the title for the report, and the title would have been, It's All Ethics All of the Time, People. Um, for some reason, that wasn't uh, sort of accepted. But the fact that there is so much ethics, uh, it's good for me. You know, that's good news. I'm an ethicist. That's good news. Um, it's also bad news, and it's bad news in two ways that I want to mention. The first is that I'm going to have to work really hard in the next 20 minutes to actually find something different to say from what has been said already. Uh, I think I can. I've got a couple of additions, but there is a significant amount of overlap with what's already been in the presentations. That's the first bit of bad news. The second bit of bad news for me is that you are all sitting out there thinking, ah, oh, finally, the ethicist, he has an algorithm to solve these problems. Um, and I, I do, I mean, seriously, I do think that has a misunderstanding of what an ethicist does. An ethicist does not come to complicated problems with algorithms. Um, an ethicist comes with certain conceptual tools for sort of separating issues out and for seeing how issues are perhaps nested, how they're interconnected, uh, and hopefully the ethicist uh, has a way of making the discussion more accessible, making it more palatable, if possible. So we've covered already today the uh, potential desirable things uh, that gene drives could do, whether they're in public health, uh, in conservation, or in agriculture. And we've also covered, especially just in the last presentation, the role that the, the sort of hype has played in this discussion. And I, Helen said this very well already, but I just want to um, sort of add, from my perspective as, as an ethicist, wh when you enter a discussion that's already taking place, and, and the dominant sort of meme in the discussion is, we could stop those 435,000 deaths a year from malaria. Um, you're feeling pretty nervous even when you enter the discussion, because you're feeling that if you raise any questions about it, um, the, the sort of immediate response is, well, so you're not interested in stopping those 435,000 de 435, deaths? Um, and so that setting of the scene, which is a, a social setting of the scene, is also, I, I want us to notice, it's an ethical setting of the scene. Uh, and so that sort of stacks the deck. It makes it, uh, I think, somewhat complicated to enter into uh, this discussion. So the way we organized our chapter is uh, we sort of made a very obvious comment right at the beginning and said these ethical arguments are only going to be decisive if the technical problems can be solved. And then secondly, if, um, in, in assuming those technical problems have been solved, uh, if there aren't any other ethical values that are at stake that are going to be threatened by these technologies. And so that first question is really, that's not a question for me at all. Uh, it was really covered in the morning sessions. Um, but that second question is more a question for me and for Fern uh, 
um, what sorts of ethical disvalues might attend uh, these uh, technologies. We organized our work in terms of three, I'm calling them here zones of ethical concern. And this was actually fairly atypical from what you might expect uh, an ethicist to do when looking at gene drives. So a more typical thing would be to say, well, there are consequentialist types of arguments, then there are virtue ethics types of arguments, uh, there are deontological types of arguments. We actually didn't want to do that because if you do that, you set up the expectation that if I look at it this way, let's say in terms of public health, I can come up with an answer as to whether gene drives are okay or not. Or if I look at it this way, uh, in terms of conservation benefit, I can use some principles to come up with an answer and I can settle the issue. And I think that's not really so realistic because what's more realistic is that there's sort of uh, front and center, sort of immediate pragmatic concerns, there's sort of mid-level principle types of concerns, there's um, sort of in the background worldview types of concerns. And those three varieties kind of push and pull against each other. Uh, and so some particular consequences will matter more if you have a certain type of worldview in place. If you have a different type of worldview in place, a different consequence will matter more. So there's the, the point of putting the three circles there is to say there's sort of a push and pull, an interreaction, an ecosystem of values, if you like, uh, which govern this discussion. And our strategy, for sure, uh, was to try and think about the ethics in that ecosystem of values type of way. So, we've got these three things I'm going to go through quickly. The first one I can go through very quickly because it's mostly from the morning's discussion and a little bit from, the, from Helen's discussion. The idea that there are uh, potential impacts uh, that might be ethical disvalues that counter the suggested ethical advantages. Um, it was mentioned a little earlier, how many people have actually read a scientific paper? You know, when you're a philosopher, it's, it's tough, you know? <laughs> but... Uh, in doing the reading for the chapter, a bunch of sort of red flag issues came up for me. Uh, and this, this is sort of a visual in the sense that it's red. Um, so the sort of visual is to say, okay, possibly these could be certain sorts of worries. And um, they were covered, some of these, most of these, were covered earlier on this morning. And sort of in summation, what those worries look like is, well, maybe there's unpredictability in there, or maybe these gene drives won't actually work. So that's one type of consequentialist impact type of ethical question. Um, if there are those uncertainties, you get this worry, and this is a term, it was used by Helen, um, but it, it sort of originates here from Alfred Nordman, who, who has written on the ethics of nanotechnology. You get the worry that your ethics is a speculative ethics, where a certain type of speculation is already shaping the playing field. And I think that's possible. If those red flag issues are as red, uh, as sometimes it sounds, then there, there is a speculative ethics at work which is shaping the conversation already. So those are the one types of sort of physical, empirical impacts. There's another type of impact which is more an impact on justice. Uh, and Helen has emphasized these well enough already, but questions about power, uh, questions about dependency, um, questions about um, imperialism, uh, uh, maybe that's not the right word in this context, uh, but these sorts of social political questions are also matters, we think, of impact. Um, I was at uh, an Ethics of Gene Drive symposium at the University of California, San Diego, uh, two weeks ago, and there was somebody from Target Malaria there, it was really sort of interesting, and we, we've touched on this a little bit today, but um, the, the question of the quality of the public engagement um, in Burkina Faso by target malaria uh, was raised sort of in, in this topic, in this conversation in San Diego, very briefly. Um, you know, is, is the public engagement going okay or is it problematic? And then also raised, which, which hasn't been mentioned here yet, that there was this question, it was suggested that some of the NGOs uh, that oppose the technologies are, and, and the phrase was manufacturing opposition. Um, and, you know, who, who, who knows? But What's interesting, I think, about that is there's public engagement questions both in, on both sides of this debate, uh, in, in terms of those promoting the technology and in terms of those opposing the technology. So those two that I've mentioned so far are in the impacts category. Let's turn now to the interventions category. And uh, some of this, I would say, comes out of my particular location in Montana, my particular location in environmental ethics, 
But gene drives pose questions about the sort of types of principles involved, the types of precedents they might set, the types of uh, valued ideas uh, they might challenge or support or something like that. And I want to put this on the table. And I've got a couple of things here that I think are new to our discussion so far today. Um, in environmental ethics, generally, there is a presumption that non-interference is good, and interference, when it happens, has to be uh, sort of restricted or managed in certain ways. Um, I think this presumption uh, is still in place with gene drives, and it's especially in place with gene drives, I think, um, because we're talking about a certain level of intervention. Um, and this idea of the metabolism of the planet, I mean it metaphorically. It, this is not sort of a literal belief for me that the planet is, is, is sort of a being that has a metabolism. But even metaphorically, I think it's important to uh, recognize that to intentionally, in a targeted way, disrupt Mendelian inheritance is a different level of interference, and one that I think some people are going to find problematic. Um, so there's a non-interference presumption. There's also in environmental ethics a presumption about maintaining naturalness. You know, to put it very basically, nature matters in some fashion in environmental ethics. And the, the nature that involves organisms living their lives out there in the wild, and you know, as Kevin mentioned uh, just a little earlier before lunch, this isn't, just, uh, this isn't just sort of mosquitoes we're talking about here, it's mammals that are getting poisoned. Um, the idea that you know, in environmental ethics you should be interested in the quality of life uh, of those organisms that will be affected, uh, I think is highly relevant here. There's a, those of you in uh, sort of academic environmental philosophy know that there is this move in, in the so-called Anthropocene to take our discussions beyond the idea of naturalness. Um, you know, the, the Earth is no longer pristine, we've just got to get over that, uh, and we've got to think about more sensible ways to manage the planet. Um, I want to push back against that idea just a little bit um, and say that even though it's obvious that the Earth is no longer pristine, this notion of nature and this notion of naturalness uh, plays an important role for people in their conception of who they are and in their conception of how they exist in the world. Uh, and you sort of see this, this, these signs uh, in these protests. Um, I bet everybody in these protests sort of understands that the world is impacted and is no longer pristine. And yet, the idea of naturalness, the idea of nature, still matters to some degree. Um, before lunch, we had this discussion about whether gene drives could actually drive extinction. We just noted in our report that this is an unusual thing for humans to be doing. Maybe there are cases when it is uh, something they should do, but it is an unusual thing for humans to be doing. Um, and I also want to put on the table something that, that we haven't discussed yet. Um, I come at this a little bit as a European living in the United States and then looking back to Europe and finding quite a lot of excitement in this rewilding movement. Um, you know, the, the rewilding movement is an attempt to put or to allow, facilitate natural processes to sort of uh, reassert themselves on the landscape in certain ways. And so you see that in the taking down of dams, you see that in the uh, allowing the return of wolves or perhaps reintroducing wolves or reintroducing wizent or beavers or Eurasian lynx. Um, there's an excitement around this idea, and that excitement reflects the fact, I think, that nature is not over, and some people are interested in nature returning. Some people are interested in natural processes calling the shots instead of humans calling the shots. So that was our, the second category. The third category, this category of intention, this is sort of a step back a little bit and think of broader kind of background considerations or concerns. And this first one, I put this up here, it's sort of an obvious one, and I put the terms playing God up there, because I immediately want to say this is not really a playing God issue. Um, it's really, a, it's an issue, I mean, if you say it's a playing God issue, that immediately sort of restricts you to a certain conception uh, of a sort of metaphysical world that has, uh, you know, some divine power or something like that. You don't have to um, think that some of these technologies are playing God to think that humans might not perhaps want to interfere or want to insert themselves into a system that maybe has a certain history of independence from humans or insert themselves into a system that maybe uh, 
exist because of cherished types of relationships between certain types of spirit beings in that world. There are many different ways of pulling on this playing God type of uh, objection or concern, uh, and I think many of those ways are still in play. Um, we haven't yet talked about reductive thinking or non-relational thinking, um, but there has, by implication, sort of been this concern that, you know, genomes are not necessarily things that you can sort of grab one piece and replace it with another piece. All of the factors outside of the genome that govern its expression suggest that the type of thinking or the type of worldview that is appropriate perhaps should be a relational type of worldview, perhaps a less reductive type of worldview that might be more appropriate. Um, a third type of approach, sort of worldview, sort of big picture type of approach, is to be concerned about the virtues and vices uh, that might be at play. And the one obviously most frequently used in this context is the one of hubris, uh, which was um, sort of suffered by Icarus here uh, in getting too close to the sun. But clearly, um, the, the worldview that brings some people uh, to gene drives with concern is one that focuses on virtues and vices, such as vices, such as hubris, virtues, such as humility. Um, and then finally, uh, in our section on intention, we talk about technological fixes, and we talk about uh, some of the, the problems with focusing on the wrong type of technological fix. It's only one month ago that this vaccine started being uh, experimented with uh, in Africa. 30 to 40 percent effectiveness is, is what I have heard. That's, that's okay as a start. Uh, and so, you know, maybe there are other potential technological fixes. Uh, and, of course, as has been mentioned already, perhaps other ways of addressing uh, the malaria problem. Maybe not, but as has been said, I think, adequately already, we need to take those other ways seriously. The language at the COP in November is promising and helpful in certain ways. Uh, one thing interesting about the language is it seemed like people on both sides of the debate uh, embraced the decision, um, and you know, that might count as a success, right, if you have some sense of satisfaction on both sides of the debate. Um, if you look at the terms I've highlighted, precaution, scientific soundness, appropriate risk management, some good stuff in here, prior and informed consent, though we've already problematized how you can do that a little bit. Um, what you notice about most of those red terms is they still are very much sort of focused on uh, a science-driven type of process with a little bit of politics and policy in it in terms of consent, but uh, it's a risk management, sound science, precautionary type of approach. That's good as far as it goes, um, but I think it's clear by this stage in the day uh, that we need to uh, go further than that. And, as I'm getting towards the end here, just a little comparison with SRM climate engineering, which is something that I've been involved in. There's a lot of, when you read about gene drives, there's a lot of overlap with the concerns about the management of solar radiation uh, through the deployment of sulfate aerosols. And the sorts of overlap, uh, I think, are you know, illustrated here. You're sort of, you've got a very complex system, the climate or the genome. You've got, obviously, these transboundary possibilities, this certain amount of uncertainty, this real challenge about whether you can actually model it adequately or test it adequately before deploying it. You've got the rich-poor dynamic, uh, and you've got these issues of procedural justice. So, in climate engineering, what we found uh, is a sort of an acceptance now that the, the ethical discussion, the governance discussion, should not be driven from science. And so I just highlight this paper just as a, an interesting one because it ties into uh, some of the things that I, I, I think are clear by this point of the day about gene drives. Um, there are limits for in, in an expert-driven, outcome-oriented, risk-based understanding of equity, or you could say that understanding of ethics. There are limits to that sort of understanding of ethics. There are limits to thinking that science should drive this discussion, uh, and there are limits and problems with pushing the uh, governance issues downstream. Um, an almost parallel paper uh, just came out in the gene drive discussion. Uh, the suggestion that, you know, obviously we need a lot of science on this issue, but there is a lot more that needs to be uh, in the ballpark in the discussion. Um, Fern, uh, towards the end of the paper, made some recommendations about governance, and this is work that Fern has done with Sarah Hartley and, and with Brian. Uh, 
actually. And there are certain sort of values here in these governance strategies that I think are worth paying attention to for sure. Uh, particularly that third one, broadening the range of actors and knowledge types that get into this discussion. Uh, and number five, responding to changing conditions. And that's just not responding to changing empirical conditions, but it's responding to changing value conditions. Uh, responding to societies that may think certain ways on certain technologies and may shift how they think on those technologies. Um, so just in case you didn't recognize the person because he's got a white coat on here, I put his name up there. Um, Kevin uh, was in a, a, an article in The New Yorker in 2017, uh, which was the interview was conducted by, by Michael Spector. Um, and I was terribly impressed uh, in that article with what was said about uh, how gene drives demand something different from us uh, in terms of how we think of science, how we think the science functions. And I think in the session before lunch, um, that actually came through uh, in equally as powerful a way. Um, and one of the things I've enjoyed uh, about being in the ethics of some of these emerging technologies is sort of recognizing in climate engineering, for example, um, David Keith, uh, David Keith has studied ethics. David Keith sees ethics as being involved in any discussion of climate engineering. And I think it's clear that uh, Kevin does in the discussion of gene drive organisms. And I think the, the sort of take-home message uh, that I want to leave you with is that that is more important now with these kinds of technologies than it has ever been before. Thank you. <laughs>